I'm Billy Hernandez, president of the Writing Club at IRSC. This will actually be my last semester attending with IRSC before I transfer to UCF, so you know, I'm hoping to make the best out of my last attendance for this conference. This first poem is a one-sided dialogue, kind of a forbearing, definitely a warning. The Malin Streak. But sometimes the night reveals the only truth that time passes, and things will never be the same again. Delphine de Vion. I could only look at my glass of cola with listlessness as the cynical man spoke his piece. His voice was not unlike the tanned gravel leading into our shared refuge from the world's endeavors. The auburn color of his hair seemed to have faded in his age. In some places, whole locks gave way to a lightness that told of a future succumbing to gray. I dreaded seeing him again. He was a regular at the diner overlooking a restless, ambitious city. Speaking of philosophies and natural truths in the hours I was shielded away from the gravity of becoming that weighed on me. I'll never forget our last day together. Big man, becoming, I see you. Fresh from finals, fully realized freedom fighter, fiercely feuding, flinging unfiltered firebombs from your face. Front man for the future. I apologize in advance for their cadence, their well past patience. These men and women voice a storm against injustices from which they are born. Festivities are in order, for God told them the meek shall inherit the earth. I apologize in advance, but we don't want your blood-soaked dirt, your war fertilizer, your turf of turmoil. We've long since realized your war-torn topsoil screams, I'm human too. Please. Blood fruit was all that you have ever grown, and that really isn't in our diet, so we'll starve, I guess. I apologize in advance, but this last test wasn't in the lesson plan. You think you're fully committed, man? So you know freedom fighting has a price. Are you ready to die? What are words to an actual incendiary device? Philadelphia, 1985. You don't think they'll hurt you too? Pacific Coast, 1942. They'll ostracize you, you socialist mouthpiece. McCarthyism, 1950, 1980, 2020. Just give them the chance. You're not ready, man. This road, this road you're on is caked with the lives of the brave. Its bricks are wrought with a blood so thick it's like a mire. Is this really what you so desire? To walk the Mojave day after day after scorching day, donning lips and tongue so cracked it hurts to pray for even a drop of water. Tell me, in this Sinclair jungle, can you tell foe from foliage? Are you more Tarzan than khaki? When you traverse this dense vine-ridden jungle, are you willing to turn away Eve's apple? Their money is in the military. There's opportunity, upward mobility. Storm another country for me, please. I'll pay for college. I'll get you out of poverty. Take my hand. Are you strong enough to say no? I wasn't. Sorry, man. And with that, the man with the mountain streak slid a bronze pin next to my beverage. An insignia of a proud eagle, face turned towards the olive branch stuck in its razor-like talons. He paid for my drink that day, and as I walked out to thank him, ask him what it was he saw in me to say such powerful things, I only caught a glimpse of him, flinging himself from that gravelly cliff, arms out at both sides, head high as if in defiance to that restless, ambitious city. Picture this as portrayed in reverse chronological order, but it's also entirely hypothetical, beginning almost autobiographical before deviating to capture the climate in which the youth are becoming. Picture this. American radical takes landslide victory. The people's pride, prominent prophet, promised son. Billy comes from William, William from Wilhelm. Wilhelm from the Germanic elements, will and helm. Will to desire, helm. Helmet, protection. Billy, William means resolute protector. Don't we love that narrative? That one man curative? That David representative pitching winds against a Goliathian corruption? Our habit to look up at the sky, hoping that if we see God, everything in his infinite presence will be okay. But it isn't, is it? Picture this. 
You're in an apartment too small to be a forever home and a suit and tie too big to be your own. More shadow than man, but more man than boy. A familiar ringtone. No speech tonight. Do you have room in your taxes for two more lives? Didn't think so. Picture this. Pressured by poverty, pressured by poverty. Sorry. You're pushing plate to get these pets. You're pushing plate to get these pets. Up to grade, up to grade for army pay, for army pay. Slip the disc, slip the disc, go back a space, go back a space. Don't pass go. Picture this. Melancholic man manages medical expenses. A miracle? No. Crowdfunding. A gift from post-operation alleviation to oxycotton addiction. We all know one. And this and this is the rub. I'm being crushed in the gravity of becoming, frothing at the mouth as I contemplate variables, precariously trudging through a trough of debt, not daring to touch a pearl of sustenance to save myself from falling and joining the spread. And worst of all, in this cannibal's carnival, to jump the hurdles, traverse the tightrope, skip through contingencies, and win that coin flip every single time, and not love the man that comes out the other side. Becoming is the third poem. Touching on my own experiences with coming into myself, I think in spite of the tone of the first two, I'm very happy with the person that I found. Though we live in capitalism and its power seems inescapable, so did the divine right of kings. Any human power can be resisted and changed by human <laughs> beings. <laughs> Ursula K. Le Guin. <laughs> Becoming. I have been angry all my life at 17, I had this canker in my core, cancerous, crackling with conflict as it consumed every fiber of me, outward, omnidirectional, omnipresent, ostracizing me, preventing me from sustaining my calves in that gravity of becoming. How could I even think about raising tomorrow when I was nursing yesterday's sore? All days were yesterday, and I always longed for the day before when the pain was just a fraction less cursed. Yes. I was angry, but without direction. I want to take this next line to thank the person responsible for sharpening my pitchfork and pointing it at the enemy. But I won't need it. Pointed sticks and plumes of fire are not the solution to a world built on pointed sticks and plumes of fire. To be the baneful stone hurled from that venerated sling, dismantling oppression as it destroys what you create with a smile on your face, defiantly loving the change that is delicate in the moment. That's, that's the stuff. To get out of bed, out of anger, but be warm and welcoming like a patron saint, pain putting time in the soup kitchen with a full pot of beef stew before them. That's, that's the stuff. Sorry, I miss beef stew. I'm on a diet and I cannot wait to have it again. Optimism in the face of those insurmountable odds. That's, that's the stuff. To not only believe in the child bearing yesterday's burden under tomorrow's gravity, but to teach them how to bear the weight by example, thus lightening the load, giving them time to look back and love the person they've become. Thank you. All right, so um, next we have another member, um, a very vibrant uh, poet, Madison Dupree, who is gonna come and present her work. Hello, my name is Madison Dupree. Um, I am a part of the IRC Learning Club. Uh, I'm so happy to be here today and to be able to share your work um, at this conference. Uh, the poems that I will be presenting today are Flowers in My Bedroom, The Enchanted Well, and For What Is Hope. 
I believe that my poems fit the theme of coming of age because they are expressed through the dramatic lens of a young person. My work mostly relates to newly navigating love and the feelings that come with exploring relationships and boundaries. Um, my work specifically relates to other kind of love, which I think fits the theme of coming of age because with, 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 uh, with every relationship that you make, um, whether it comes to fruition or not, you can learn a bit about yourself and the kind of person you want to be. I think that poetry is an outlet I use myself to reflect my own experiences and shape how I view the world. So, the first poem I will be reading is Flowers in My Bedroom. This poem relates to the theme of coming of age because it deals with letting someone into your private world, your bedroom, um, a place that someone spends the most time alone. And this poem reflects on trusting someone to stay that eventually grows. Flowers in my bedroom. Flowers flow from my bedroom walls. Don't let the petals drip down to the floor. The lights flicker as they fall. Pretty colors you crave more. They smell like sunshine, something intangible. You tell yourself you're fine, which is completely understandable. I look at you to see that smile. Those flowers match your eyes. We watch the flowers grow for a while. You tell me lovely lies. You say that it's not crazy to feel insane. You say that you're lucky to not have the pain. You say that I'm lovely like those flowers. You say you could sit here and look for hours. I want to believe you when you say those things. The petals pile poorly on my floor. Just then, the bell rings. Time's up. You swore never to leave me, never to ignore. But you did, and now you're gone. And now, all I smell freshly cut The second poem I will be reading is The Enchanted Well. In this poem, I wanted to achieve alliteration in siblings. While it doesn't have a set rhyme scheme like my last, it has both a plot and a deeper meaning. The deeper meaning of this poem is finding something that is so, so intoxicating that you cannot even stop yourself. Um, I believe that this word can relate to a person or a vice. This poem relates to the theme of coming of age by showing the depth of addiction one can have to a person or thing. The Enchanted Well. I am unable to discard this enchanting well. It is pleasantly plentiful with poisonous pretense. Its pleasing, placid surface calmly calls to me. I fill my cup with utter ignorance and fail to see a demise of my own making. Satisfactory swallows make for folly filled stomachs, the effects of which don't seem to progress until the cup lies empty. Slipping softly, my, I fall further into the well. Sinking slowly, my skin surges with the pangs of painful longing. I am stuck inside this well too deep down to climb out. I look to the sky, like blues that fade. It slowly slips away as I sink deep. The final poem I will be presenting is, What is Hope? This poem gives the imagery of a war zone or a place of terror. Someone who is on their own battlefield as a bystander or soldier left in turmoil. This poem relates the theme of coming of age because the analogy of the destruction could simply be a discouraging outcome of an opportunity. This poem alludes to how the problems in someone's life may feel as overwhelming as a war zone. But what is hope? When all is lost, but what is hope? When the walls crumble, the floor, picking up the broken pieces, trying to cope, feeling the destruction to the core. For what is hope? When the bombs didn't stop coming, when the soot of the earth remained even with soap, 
Remembering those of the past is numbing. For what is hope? When the only sound is a constant humming, I can feel your fingers consistent strumming, telling me that I shouldn't mope. Is this the way that I should cope? Is there more than this, just this pain? More than destruction? More than the slain? I stand here watching, stand well shaken, and wonder if I could be mistaken. Was there a lesson to it all? Something to hold on to, big or small? To help rebuild what was lost, sacrifice was the ultimate cost. I must have hope for better days. I must have hope for better ways because I keep on to all this pain and it is making me insane. Thank you. <clears throat> all right, so um, now we have our you know, prolific poet, Russell Griffith Chandler, who has published seven poems in our second volume. Ooh, ooh. Um, as a poet, um, I oh, this uh, my name is Russell Griffith Chandler. Um, I go to school here um, on and off. One of my um, reasons for being a poet and writing is to tell stories and viewpoints for um, people who have been oppressed and their ideas shunned by the public. Um, a lot of times when I'm uh, when I see violence across the world and I see injustice, I like to write and share my poems to have something to look forward to, something that can inspire, something to have meaning in life. So um, this poem, there's, this poem is called Stranded Doll. Um, it's, a, it's about a black trans woman who told me that she was kicked out of um, her house as a teenager in Trinidad, forced to um, do sex work to, um, to survive. Um, she told me that at the age, at my age of 21, I am now 25, and it means so much to me, and even still, I think about it because this could have been me. My family, I'm so blessed to have a family that is queer, and a lot of people don't have that blessing. Um, I'm gonna find a poem. Okay, Shannon Dahl. She lays there on her own, the sun beats on her skin, boiling insides filled with cotton. She suffers, she has no voice, the heat is crisp, the rain drifts upon her, feels like acid. As the weather melts off its face, sad girl she is, alone in the dark. The fabric is open, leaving my clouds tangled with dirt that resemble stormy days. She lays there in the park, does not acknowledge a soul. Sad girl she is, no one's favorite dog. Showing skin that draws out the insides, forced to fend for herself. Um, then there's this other um, poem called um, Let Us Live So We Can Vote. And it's inspired by um, other like black trans women who um, are scapegoated by both the LGBT community as a whole and by the black community as a whole, caught between two places where they are not um, welcomed and seen as a person. Um, it's also about how um, the, the rage and abuse and killing from 
um, a lot of white people and white cops who see, um, um, who just wants to kill another black person, knowing that um, marching, that a lot of black people are not going to march for us and speak up for us. And um, they try to clear the, clear the streets of L black LGBT people to um, purify the streets of sin. So um, this is the poem. Hold on, I gotta get it. Let us live so we can vote. Studies say transgender people of color are killed once every three days. Non-governmental organization data of the murder of transgender population in the United States states that transgender people may not face higher risk of being murdered than cisgender people, but young black trans women certainly have a higher risk of being murdered. Let us live so we can vote. Let us live so we can vote. Let us live so we can vote. In America's inner workings, we know your crimes. We've witnessed the untelevised growing murders of our trans sisters. Envision us trans sisters rising from the dead, haunting every existence of a trans folk whose tongue cuts like a shredder by the bailing of the moon and the ghostly fog of blood dark as wine emerging from the murky waters of the Everglades. A black translator of rage accompanies you, accompanies them behind their back within the mirror as you step out of the shower before night slumber to remind you of the thousand of, thousands of trans people lying on the concrete with distorted hips and gates mouths chunks of blood running down their legs onto the velvet dress, an eon of terror. Spirit leaves and evolves into an angry translator of rage to haunt involving non-inclusive corporate offices. While I lay there, lifting my skirt up to use the men's bathroom stall. To hell with every man's proper insecurity to probably walk the way into adulthood. I am not your dirty little secret. I will not be after my death, and you will hear my name. We will be visible on the ballot. Let us live so we can vote. Let us live so we can vote. Let us live so we can vote. Um, this last poem is more positive and, um, it's called Opera Daisy, and um, I wrote it when I was in despair and um, feeling that there was no way out, but I tried to find a tunnel at the end, and I tried to inspire people who have um, been feeling down and um, helpless. Okay, Opera Daisy. All the days we spend together in an endless colony of peace filled with love. One daisy from a distance slows to the ground in desolate shame. Nothing grows along its roots. Dry, frizzled out petals plucks out against the brittle breeze. And as the daisy muffles in its breath, our daisy only flourishes in the somber darkness of the night where the quiet of birds don't sing their prayers or does not make a subtle sound. During the illuminate rivals of the moon, the last she brings seeps into the roots of the opera daisy. It twists, it knocks, it bends to reach the darkness. Opera daisy thrives in the night, but dies in the sunlight. The daisies tisk in vain beliefs as they grow above it. The opera daisy falls from hope, chuckles in agony and catatonic movements through the wintry wind. Morning comes, and opera daisy is ground to dust. The daisies is now part of every life, is now part of every ecosystem, 
It is never alone. All right, so now we have our last poet, Christopher Nairn, who's going to come and give his thoughts. My name is Christopher Nareen, and I have been a member of the Indian River State College Writing Club since spring of 2020. <clears throat> I've been told by colleagues and peers that the works uh, in which I write are that of existential poetry, and all of my poems that I will be reading today all come from different things that I've experienced and endured over many years. The first poem that I will be reciting is entitled Transparent Labyrinth. I wrote it in dedication to an old friend who was in a very unhealthy and very toxic relationship. And it was a poem that just, it perfectly expressed how I perceived the nature of their relationship to me. It goes, she looked at him with inquisitive eyes staring but never seeing, searching for an internal light, always listening when he's speaking. He whispered empty promises built on half-forgotten lies, and when they never came to fruition, it had always caught her by surprise. And then one day, she wept away, all the teardrops from her eyes, because the pain had left her so ashamed of the love she had The next poem that I'll be reciting is Farewell of the Broken. This was a poem that I wrote a while ago, and over time, as, I've, as it has been peer-reviewed, its meaning has grown even deeper for me. It ties into the coming of age theme because of catharsis, and it's some, it was a poem that I had the pleasure of reciting to my dear, dear beloved grandfather just a few weeks before his passing back in June. And since then, as I revisited it, its meaning has only been enhanced for me. It goes, Bury me deep beneath the sea, my limbs at rest with creatures, my eyes blinded by the abyss, my soul permeating the ocean, my heart conquered by beauty. The next poem that I will be reciting is called Sunsets. This poem is very personal to me <clears throat> as it was a poem that I had written when I decided that I wanted to decipher my own feelings for someone who I thought that I was in love with. And now that uh, it's been peer reviewed, like the rest of the poems that I've read thus far, I understand. I understand it in a deeper way than I did before. It's a poem that goes along with the coming of age theme as because as we come of age and we grow into adulthood, and we begin to understand more and more things, we can break down the way that we perceive relationships that we are in or feelings that we have. It goes, to walk amid the sand, clustered by the sound of waves crashing. Faster and faster they go, undefeated, unfettered, unified through the sound of splatter. Is that where I'd find you? Hiding beneath the crevices of the boardwalks, unkempt by the evening heat, longing for moisture? Or would you appear in a dream, gazing senselessly into the deep blue, tethered to the sunset, longing for nighttime. The final poem that I will be reciting is one that I just recently wrote. It's entitled City of Ghosts. It is a poem that I wrote in dedication to several peers and friends of mine that I've seen. And I wrote it when I was in a very spiritual, spiritual place, a place that I'm still in. It goes, 
City of ghosts. City of ghosts. A city of lost spirits. Undone by poisons and meager things, the earth they shall inherit. They float around in empty spaces in constant search for home, observing bodies standing tall while their spirit floats alone. These ghosts have promised living things, a life which shall be known. Promises built on promising, promises, promising infinite places to go. Places filled with spaces, filled with faces on their own. But do all these spaces filled with faces make the traces towards a home? Spirits wise up at the angels high up, for the kingdom has its throne. Thank you. And now we have uh, the co-advisor, another co-advisor, and a very good friend of mine and colleague, Dr. Sedustin Joseph, who will be reciting some of his original poems. And I'm not sure if he's if he's going to read the translations as well, but you know the stage is his. Okay, I uh, I'm going to read a poem by prominent uh, Haitian writer Jacques Roumet who was not only a poet, a um, political activist, he was the founder of the Haitian Communist Movement, party, I'm sorry, uh, in 1934. Uh, he's known for his famous novel, Masters of the Du. Um, and in fact, uh, the French title is called Gouverneur de la Rosée. Um, four years ago, I had the pleasure to write a book about his life, his uh, ideas, and his political actions. He wrote this poem when he was in exile. He was forced in exile to France uh, in 1938. So he dreamed of going back home. He dreamed uh, to be with his family, to his wife, Nick and their uh, daughter in Haiti. Uh, so what I'll do, I'll, uh, I'm going to share the French translation uh, with you first. It's a very short poem. Then I'll, I'll share the English, my English translation. Je rêve quand je rêve Tes mains fragiles sur mon visage Mes larmes Amère contre tes droits, te souviens-tu de la pluie tiède dans la chevelure des arbres tremblants? La nuit venait, c'était une cendre bien douce sur les chagrins du jour, mon front glacé dans la corbeille de tes bras nus. Ma joue, ma lèvre, au point des fruits secrets et chers, la lampe éteinte, nos ombres 